not going to do it. <laughs> so since it began in 1986, the um, CQ Contest Hall of Fame has recognized some of the most outstanding contributors to our sport. And tonight we have the honor of inducting uh, two more into the hall. And anyone who is nominated for this, you know, has to have contributed on a broad basis uh, to the sport of contesting. And it's more than just being active or being successful in contesting. It's more than just being an operator. You actually have to give back uh, to the sport. So past inductees have contributed to our hobby and radio sport in a number of ways. They've brought new people into the hobby. They've formed radio clubs. They've mentored new contesters. They've written articles. They've unselfishly given their time, uh, either to judge radio contests or just to contribute to contesting. And uh, they've acted in a leadership role to organize expeditions. They've just done all these things that make things happen. So nominations are made by clubs or by groups of three or more individuals. Uh, they're contributed, they're submitted to CQ Magazine. The nominations are voted on by the directors of the various CQ Magazine contests. And in the end, unfortunately, only two were selected each year. And believe me, we had way more than two this year that were all um, worthy. So we've got the best of the best. Our first, not, uh, our first inductee this evening is Ward Silver, N0AX. And Ward will be introduced by Kirk boxcar pickering, <laughs> K4RO. For those of you who were here last night, there was a motion made, perhaps we should put this nomination aside, given the singing and lyrics of last night. But we have decided to proceed. So Kirk, come on up and uh, introduce Ward for us. Was that your speech? <laughs> John said I only had 45 minutes, so I'm gonna try to keep this brief. <laughs> Not really that much, actually. Uh, I emailed Ward many years ago about some tips for contesting. He said he'd have a cup of coffee and write me a brief summary, so we're going to begin with page one. Uh, okay. well, come talk to me, I'll tell you the secret. Well, I'll tell you right now. Let's get on the air, make contacts, and learn why you're doing it. That's how it works. Um, boy, easy guy to find nice things to say about. That's First thing I'll tell you. Um, four things come to mind when I think of Ward. He's a teacher and a mentor, and not just to myself, but probably everybody in this room and countless others who've read his publications and who've learned from his various, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it's big. <laughs> so, uh, from hands on radio, dummies, uh, the, the update, you know, he just he continues to give us each so much and it's phenomenal the amount of time he's put into all that. We're really grateful, I'm very grateful. The other thing I think about when I think of Ward is he's our leader. He's very community-minded. He really cares incredibly deeply about all of you and about this game and about what we mean to each other. And he understands that on a really deep level that's very special and very rare in, in my world anyway. And he's one of the ones that really helped me realize that the community is what this thing is all about, not who scores the highest or has the biggest rig. You know, it's, about, it's about the community. So he's a real leader in that regard, and I learn from him every day about that. Um, his roles in WRTC, YASME, you know, the list is just so long, I'm not even gonna try. Um, and you know, he cares about the youth and the future of this game a lot. If you've attended any of his countless talks, you know, all over the U.S. and probably elsewhere. You know, he's usually talking about the future and how, and how we can keep this thing alive for people. And this is a man who spends a lot of time thinking about these things, and we should all be incredibly grateful. So, another thing I think about when I think of Ward is he's the court jester of, of contesting. He has a very special way of revealing the truth about what contesting is and isn't, and even some of the darker sides of it, but he does it in a way that doesn't hurt too much. And that's what comedians do, and that's what jesters do. They reveal the truth in a way that we can tolerate. And this is, a very, again, a very special gift of his, and I'm really grateful that, that he's able to, to do that for us. 
Also along the uh, Jester line, you know, who else could come up with the spurious emissions? <laughs> I mean, just, just the whole concept of it has only come to the mind of where it's over. Uh, a bit of a Tom Sawyer because he was pretty good at roping people into doing stuff. <laughs> and they don't really know they want to do it until they do it, so he has to give a little nudge, so thanks for that. And finally, he's a friend and a very dear one to me, and very dear one to you all, I'm sure. Um, he's generous, he's got a big heart, he shares his wisdom with great kindness and great enthusiasm and it's it's just a wonderful thing and he's helped me through good and bad times of contesting so even when I was disillusioned you know he encouraged me to that it was a big world out there and I should look around it took about six months to realize there was no way I could walk away from this community of people and you know or help nudge me in that direction and I'm eternally grateful so your friend and mine Ward Silver congratulations <laughs> Contest Hall of Fame, and it reads in recognition of his extraordinary and unselfish contribution to the sport of amateur radio contesting, Ward Silver, N0AX, elected May 2015. Congratulations and welcome. the unforgettable W7 Radio Mexico. Um, I'd like to thank Carl and Vicki Lucho Schwab for this fine shirt. <laughs> and I would really like to thank my brothers in the Spurs um, who have really 
let some amazingly special things happen and caused a lot of orange juice to squirt out a lot of noses. <laughs> and that'd be K4RO and KX9X and W4PA and KGT and TVBOV and K0BJ and N5OT and W1BXY and W4NC. All the, these guys helped create this special little reversal of entropy that is so much fun. So there's a lot of calls and that's the point. This is a community and its currency is respect. And that's a word that's been on my mind a lot lately. Respect is something it can't be bought, can't be taken. It's only something that can be given. And then you have to, to take it in yourself. And the harder you try for it, often the less it becomes available to you. It's like trying to get inside a soap bubble. You have to have others freely bestow it on you. And then you have to take it in yourself. You have to let your own heart open up for the respect and then take it. And then you can start to make it better. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Broken the oscillation there. <laughs> okay, we'll be neutralized. Um, so I'm looking out in, in the audience and I see all you people out here and I can see tremendous operators and I see station builders and I see designers and coders and leaders and all of these wizards of tremendous power that are, that are out there. Any one of you could be up here uh, next year and many of you are already uh, in the Hall of Fame. But what I also really see are many hands reaching out and holding the community together as we share our unique opportunity to experience the world through the magic of amateur radio. And it's been a long, long, strange trip, and there's surely much more of it ahead. And I'm so looking forward to sharing mine with yours as we keep on discovering each other. For as David Brooks recently wrote, we do not find ourselves, we are found. And I want to thank you for finding me. Considered for the Contesting Hall of Fame, it's not about what you have personally accomplished in contesting, it's about what you have accomplished for the contesting community. Doug Grant was first licensed in 1967 as WN1ICD in Canton, Mass. His contesting mentor was W9HG, XK1HHN. Doug attended Lowell Technological Institute where he was instrumental in the development of the nationally recognized WA1JUY contest station. He graduated with a BSWE in 1975. Listed on the original roster from April 1977, Doug is a founding member of the Yankee Clipper Contest Club, where he held the offices of Activities Manager in 1978 and President in 1979. He has spoken at the club countless times and has written articles for the club's Scuttlebutt newsletter. 
He is also a member of the FOC and the K-1 Operators Club. Along about this time, Doug's call sign starts to make a conspicuous appearance in the results databases for CQ Magazine and the AWRL. Over the years, Doug has built numerous contest stations, including his own stations in North Reading, Mass, Wyndham, New Hampshire, and Long Island, Maine. He has also supported the construction of countless other stations, spending many hours on the towers of well-known calls, such as KC1F, K10X, KC1XX, and K1MM. Doug has a long legacy of successful contest operations from many of the world's finest multi-op stations. He was the regular 15-meter operator at W2PV. In addition, Doug has been a primary operator at many winning efforts from stations including K1EA, K1GQ, K1OX, K1RX, KC1XX, K3LR, HI8XWP, VP2E, HC8N, EJ4B, PJ9W, KP2A, 62X, and 4U1ITU. <laughs> At this point, you would think that he might have a shot at the Contesters Hall of Fame. <laughs> in 1991, Doug came up with a really interesting way to make the cover of CQ Magazine when pine trees fell on a guy wire and crumpled his tower, twice. In addition to his YCCC contributions, Doug has run the contest forum at the Dayton Hamvention for the last 20 years. He has organized and presented at many contest universities in New England and beyond. Doug is also a regular at the Dayton Contest University and has spoken in Italy and Germany and is a director of the CTU organization. Doug also served as an ARRL Contest Advisory Committee member and chairman, as well as being a founding director of the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation in 2010. With all of this, you would expect that he should be in the Contesters Hall of Fame. Doug's an evangelist for amateur radio within the engineering community, having written numerous articles for electronic trade and professional publications such as EDN and Planet Analog, where he cleverly integrates technology and amateur radio. More recently, Doug has been operating from his station in Maine, where he has recently won the CQ Worldwide Contest on both modes and currently holds the U.S. phone record. In 2014, Doug was the recipient of the Barry Goldwater Award from the Radio Club of America. This guy should certainly be in the Contesters Hall of Fame. <laughs> when it comes to the World Team Radio Sport Championship, Doug has done it, he's won it, and he's run it. He has competed in the event five times, coming away with two bronze medals and winning the gold at the inaugural event in 1990. Doug must already be in the contest of <laughs> Perhaps Doug's most notable accomplishment, however, was the recently concluded WRTC 2014 event, where nearly 500 contesters from around the world gathered to participate in the Olympics of ham radio. Doug was chairman of the event, and as a result of his leadership and vision, the event received accolades from around the world as a shining moment for contesting. Doug led a team picked from the elite contest community of one land to organize, plan, and execute the event in July of 2014. Now, back a few years before that, three years before, as newly elected president of YCCC in 2011, I became aware of the huge effort that was going on behind the scenes to take over most of the open spaces of Massachusetts three years hence for WRTC. In 2011, WRTC seemed like a glacier, moving slowly but inexorably forward. The same meeting where I was elected, Doug made a pitch for support from YCCC for WRTC 2014. His pitch was successful, and before I had a chance to look at the club's treasury, a huge chunk of it was gone. <laughs> As president of WRTC 2014, Doug was becoming increasingly involved in the huge effort to organize the event. From the outside, I can only get a glimpse of the magnitude of the job he had taken on. It was truly an incredible proposition to locate, design, fund, procure, train volunteers, provide local transportation and lodging for competitors, and finally execute the event. 
One could e easily imagine that if Doug had known then what he knows now, he would have thought more than twice about taking on the job. <laughs> With all due respect to Tim, founder of the Dayton Contest University, YCCC lays prior claim to the term Contest University. In the early 90s, YCCC members would gather on weeknight evenings at a member's home to discuss and teach important concepts of contesting to newcomers and Mossbacks alike. What always made these events so worth attending were the professors, the giants of one land, who came to teach and share their knowledge of contesting. Over the years, the YCCC versions of Contest University waned. When I took over as president in 2011, reviving the successful YCCC Contest Universities was high on my to-do list. The reason I mention all of this is because in the midst of what he had going on with WRTC 2014, Doug made it a point to volunteer countless times as professor at my revival contest universities. Despite taking on perhaps the biggest challenge in contesting, that of running the Olympics of ham radio, Doug still had time to support the club. He made time to drive many hours on a weeknight to teach contesting basics to interested newbies. For this, I am personally truly grateful. Doug, on behalf of the Yankee Clipper Contest Club, I humbly beg your forgiveness. <laughs> we wish to formally apologize to you for taking so long to nominate you <laughs> to the Contesters Hall of Fame. You see, we already thought you were in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> So basically what he said, <laughs> I, uh, I have to say I've been uh, waiting a long time to uh, uh, take on this role at the contest uh, dinner, uh, one that's a little uh, unique and, uh, and personal for me uh, for reasons you'll uh, hear shortly, but um, <clears throat> I uh, uh, took the time also to go through some of the history of all the various things that Doug has, has done. And, uh, I actually found one, Tony, you didn't mention, the founding director of WWROF, so there. <laughs> anyway, um, the list is really, really long, and um, uh, Tony was absolutely right in saying, and I just wrote in this way, but, you know, frankly, most of us would still ask, uh, why would somebody qualify for the Hall of Fame simply on those meager accomplishments? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you look at the portfolio of all the other guys, I mean, really. <laughs> so, so with that said, obviously Doug's crowning achievement, and uh, I, I think whether he accepts it or not, we certainly uh, advocated strongly with, was, of course, WRGC 2014. Um, and it was with that, uh, with, with that crowning achievement that to finally, finally, we can have a conversation about you joining the Hallowed Hall. <laughs> After all, as, uh, as Chairman Doug poured his heart and soul into what was arguably the best uh, WRTC ever, and uh, pulling uh, together a team of guys, and I believe the term I would use, uh, beating us senseless for four years, <laughs> uh, DG uh, proudly uh, waved the uh, WRTC flag in his uh, beloved uh, Boston. And uh, I'm going to do a little uh, wardrobe change here because I want to do uh, something that I know that uh, is dear to Doug's heart. So if you can just bear with me here for a moment. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> no singing. <laughs> but I, I, I thought it would be appropriate to uh, wear a Boston Strong shirt here tonight. goes my time. <laughs> so we're going to put this on here. Okay. Now we're cooking with gas. So um, I asked Doug and a few others to uh, tell us a little bit uh, of their own view and Doug's view of, uh, you know, how he does in contesting and, uh, and all of that. And I, uh, I got a little bit of an executive summary here I'd like to share with you. So these are uh, some of the common beliefs. 
When is it uh, Doug frankly can't copy or send CW worth of crap? <laughs> uh, he's uh, allegedly uh, sort of okay at uh, running guys on phone from wicked loud places like Zone 8 and I or K3LR. Um, now it's reported that he really only wins stuff uh, since uh, K1AR and K5ZD are retired from contesting and he has a wicked loud place on an island. Uh, and he um, supposedly uh, does a little bit about helping with uh, WPX and uh, CQ160 plaques. And somehow he found uh, 409 guys to do the heavy lifting for WRTC uh, and, uh, and, and managed to pull that off. He also managed, of course, to snag three WRTC medals himself, mostly by choosing the right partners. <laughs> And he, uh, he allegedly is uh, still uncomfortable with, uh, you know, those new bands. I'm not sure what they are, 13, 19, 35 meters, uh, whatever it is. And as probably 80% of this room will attest, uh, he also is known for asking people for money. <laughs> and I'm sure you are sharing the relief that he is experiencing this year, that he hasn't asked a single person in this room for money this year. Or if he has, be careful. <laughs> so, speaking of Boston, DG is a uh, New England lifer. I'll uh, modify uh, the, the quote uh, to be a little more politically correct, but uh, he was born a poor boy in Canton, Mass. And uh, that's actually not uh, uh, too much of an exaggeration. Uh, he excelled in his uh, cherished uh, Canton High School. And uh, he spent a virtual lifetime on the radio in those days, uh, doing all the cool things that all his cool high school friends uh, did, like running East Cars, <laughs> hanging out with the likes of uh, WA2ICU, WA2LQZ, WB2RKK, WA1JZC, all those famous guys you all know. Um, and then, of course, he uh, uh, discovered girls, and uh, he met his uh, future wife, Karen. Um, now, for the, uh, the three of you in this room that don't know this, um, the, the, the short form is that uh, I was introduced to uh, Karen's sister, Barbara, and uh, hence the, uh, the dec decades-long reference to Doug and I being brothers-in-law. So it's indeed uh, everything you've heard is, is true. Well, here's the bottom line. The reality is that uh, Doug and I have uh, been through uh, a lot together. We've, uh, we've laughed and uh, we've cried over the years uh, as we've celebrated success and the um, inevitable losses that, uh, that happen in life. But uh, I have to tell you that uh, out of the 500 people in this room, I can't think of a single person who I'm more proud to introduce today into the CQ Hall of Fame. Uh, my brother-in-law, fellow contester, and uh, best friend in the world, Doug Grant, came with DG. of his extraordinary and unselfish contribution to the sport of amateur radio contesting and putting up with John for a really long time. <laughs> we welcome Doug Grant, K1DG, to the Contest Hall of Fame. Welcome, Doug. Giants who've received this award in the past, and I can't believe I'm up here. Um, actually, I can't. Tony, what took you guys so long? <laughs> Jeez. Unbelievable. 
I saw a t-shirt the other day that uh, expresses, I have, I have a few pages of stuff here, but if I wanted to condense it, if you really want to get out early, um, the t-shirt said, I just want to be the person my friends think I am. Uh, that pretty well sums up what's uh, going on here. Um, you know what it says on the back of it? This, this plaque's pretty cool. The front's really nice, but on the back, you guys can't see what it says here. It says, um, I now have the right to a clear frequency in all contests. <laughs> <laughs> I asked someone to QSY and let me have the frequency. They have to do it, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ward, it's nice to see you dressed up for the occasion here. <laughs> He did say that he ironed the shirt. I didn't, I didn't even know you could iron a Hawaiian shirt, but I guess, you know, leave it to Ward. Um, Ward and I, are, it's ironic that we're sitting next to each other here because we spent uh, numbers, many, many long hours sitting next to each other at the 15 meter position at K3LR in the last five years or so. Uh, so I guess it's only natural that's where we ended up sitting here. Yeah, but I'm taking your chair when you come back. No, you're not. <laughs> um, we, uh, in, in uh, earlier this year, going to, out to operate Tim's for the ARL contest, uh, Tim suggested that we come a day early and do a road trip and stop in at DX Engineering, get the backstage tour, um, which we did, which was terrific, then uh, go up to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and uh, stay over at KDAZ, which I sort of remember, that was a really, really long night. Um, but can, but can you imagine a three-day road trip sitting next to Ward Silver and listening to him to expound on Everything. <laughs> okay. There are three things that I want to talk about tonight. Um, first of all, as VE3EJ said when he received an award like this one a few years ago, uh, getting up here is really not a single op activity, it's a multi op effort. I've had a lot of patient elders over the years and uh, I'd like to identify some of them. Uh, one has already been uh, identified. Uh, K1HHN, who was my mentor on field day. You guys never worked him. He was uh, not really a contester, but he was an amazing operator. His, uh, his CW was like music. He had the smoothest uh, methods on phone, and we operated field day together, and when it was my turn to operate, I was all tensed up and all excited, and he just put his hand on my shoulder and said, relax, kid. It's supposed to be fun. <laughs> Most important lesson I ever learned. We had a next door neighbor in Canton. Uh, his name was Bill Whipple, he wasn't a ham, um, but he was a retired Navy radio man. And many, many years later, he still remembered Mr. Morse's code. So every day after school, I would go over with my little buzzer and he would send me CW and I would try to scratch it out on a piece of paper and he was very patient until I finally got it. At least enough to pass the novice test. Um, I had a great series of mentors uh, in the members of the 1970s era uh, Murphy's Marauders Club in Connecticut. They welcomed a whole bunch of young high school and college kids uh, into their fold. They taught us how to operate. They showed us what real stations looked like. We all had really pathetic radios and even more pathetic antennas. And they showed us how to do it the right way and took us out on field day and taught us how to operate. Uh, Mark Pride, K1RX, was my mentor at our college club station. You know, we're still doing tower work together once in a while. It's been over 40 years and we're still hanging out and we're still getting along and uh, he still hasn't killed me yet, although he tried when we were in, in the college. He dropped a rotator off the tower and it missed me by mere inches. Uh, Jim Lawson, W2PV, had a huge influence on, uh, on my contest career. Uh, he invited a bunch of those scruffy college kids from the Murphy's Marauders group to come out and operate one of the finest stations ever constructed. And of course, uh, my brother-in-law here uh, was really a DXer at heart. He's turned into a reasonably competent contester. <laughs> um, he's taught me a lot uh, over the years, too. There are way too many more that I could name individually, and I feel badly if I left anyone, anyone out. So you know who you are, and thank you very much. Um, A lot's been said about the WRT, uh, WRTC 2014 event last year. Um, guys like AR and RX, who I've already mentioned, the other directors, K1KI, K1TO, WC1M, N2NT, KM3T, K5ZD, and N6TR, um, 
they did all the work. I just took all the credit. Um, without their skills and abilities and dedication, we would have had a much different event than we did. They made the thing a success. So thank you guys. We were all here. Of course, I have to also thank my wife, Karen, for putting up with all this over so many years. But I have to let you in on a little secret. In order to uh, create a more favorable attitude towards radio and contesting uh, over the years, I put in a big effort in the year uh, when I asked her to marry me in the Bermuda contest. You know what the first prize was for in the Bermuda contest in those days? All expense paid trip for two to Bermuda. That was our honeymoon. <laughs> getting your honeymoon paid for by winning a contest. Sort of set the tone for the marriage, and it's uh, 36 years later, it's still working. The second thing I'd like to talk about, uh, I'd like to do is talk about contesting a little bit. One of the volunteers at WRTC 2014, a guy who's not a contester, uh, came up to us after a club meeting when we were recruiting, and he said, you know, I don't get it. How can you make a competition out of this? I've seen field day. And all that happens is a guy calls CQ, someone calls him. He works the guy, then he calls CQ again and works another one. It doesn't seem that hard. And I would imagine that pretty much anyone can do it and pretty much everyone gets the same number of guys over a weekend. So how can you make a contest? Well, I gave him the short course, Contesting University 101, and I said, you know, you know there's certain skills you have to have. Uh, the operators need to make the choices be on the right band at the right time, run versus S&P, have a good antenna, good radios on all that. Um, but the truth is he was right. It's basically a very simple game we play. Copy what the other guy sends, log it, repeat. Simple, right? But like anything else, getting to the top is said to require 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. It takes a lot less than that to get to the point where you're having fun. And since this is a hobby, it should be about having fun. Ham radio has been good to me, especially contesting. In addition to thousands of hours of fun, it led me to a career, taught me how to set goals and work to achieve them, all from playing a fairly simple and really fun game. Let me take this one step further and say that the game of contesting and ham radio in general are both only tangentially about the technology and this absolute magic of radio communications. As cool as those things are, this game is really all about people, connecting with like-minded people who share a curiosity and a passion, regardless of economic, ethnic, geographic, political, or cultural backgrounds. Sure, we learn about the, the, about the technology, which antennas work best, which bands are open when, and all that cool stuff. But if you think about it, every QSO we make is part of the international and goodwill and international goodwill and friendship that Part 97 says is a goal of, what, of the amateur service. In my view, and we saw this at WRTC last summer when we had almost 50 countries represented, contesters are really terrific ambassadors. The overwhelming majority of radio sportsmen and women are honest, play by the rules, and they succeed through hard work and practice. And most of my closest friends in contesting are also really first-class human beings in all aspects of their lives, and it's a privilege to know them. <laughs> Last, I want to share a little personal history. A lot of hams got started when they were kids and there was another ham in a family, like a parent or an older brother or somebody. My parents were outdoors people. They were into hunting and fishing, which I just realized is why I like tuning around and chasing multipliers so much. It's the thrill of the hunt, I guess. Um, neither of my parents went to college, and when I got interested in radio, it was something they couldn't help me with. It was totally foreign. But they recognized pretty early that I seemed pretty serious about this one, and they supported me. They hooked me up with their friend who was a TV repairman, since they didn't know any hands. That introduction provided me with a steady stream of junked, dead TVs, so I had lots of parts, which I turned into a long list of really grotesque homebrew projects. <laughs> But building stuff was fun. Using it was something different. It was, it was a different animal. CW was the hardest thing I ever had to learn. And the general cap class code test was the first failure in my life. I was always a pretty good student, always did great. And failing a test was just unbelievable, failing a CW test. I have to confess it took me three tries to pass that 13 word per minute code test. Three tries, which involved going into Boston which was a tough thing to do. 
but I never gave up. And once I did pass it and I got loose in the general bands, I decided I had to slay that dragon. I put in my time every afternoon after school, talking to hams on East Cars on sideband, uh, evenings on the CW traffic nets. I discovered contesting, I got involved in the local radio club, ultimately Murphy's Marauders, and here I am almost, almost 50 years later, still talking on the radio, still hanging around with hams, and still trying to learn that stupid CW. <laughs> the other stuff I find myself doing now, like plaques, teaching at CTU, the contest forum, chairing WRTC, that's my way of giving back to the hobby that's given me so much. I hope you're all giving back a little bit too. It's really important. I have two kids. Neither one of them chose ham radio as a hobby. Neither one of them chose engineering as a profession. And I'm okay with that. When they were young, if they get frustrated by being stuck on some school subject or some piece of music, I would start telling them the story of getting my general class license. It became a legend in our family. They would roll their eyes and say, Dad, not the Morse code story again. Give me a few minutes, I'll work this through, I'll get this thing. As I said, they, they didn't choose ham radio as their hobby, they both chose music. They're both pretty good. But playing a musical instrument is as foreign to me as ham radio was to my parents. But as my parents did, I worked hard to provide the opportunity for the kids to succeed and enjoy music. I found them teachers, mentors, bought them the instruments, any other resources that I could. So my last point is, if you have kids, or nieces, or nephews, grandkids, or even neighbors' kids, who express some interest in that big antenna in the back and want to see what your radio is all about, give them your time. If your own kids don't share your interest in radio, it's okay. Figure out what they're into, nurture those passions any way you can, and with the right coaching and the right mentoring, your kid may become a star athlete, successful business person, the researcher who cures cancer. Who knows? Maybe even the next contest Hall of Fame member. So in closing, have fun. Make friends. Pay it forward. This is a hobby and that's what hobbies are supposed to be all about. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of the evening.